Good evening from our headquarters in Kiev. This is Sunday show on Hromadsky International, the only prime time um, program, TV program, explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm in English. And I am Natalia Guminyuk. And I'm Ian Bateson. Uh, first, we want to remind you we have a new app for our show, which has all of our material, all of our videos, explainers, uh, all of that for the iPhone and that you can find by searching Ramadska International at the iStore or Apple Store for Apple there. Um, we want to take a look at a slightly different direction. We want to focus tonight on ATR, which is the only uh, broadcast television network on the Crimean Peninsula that was broadcasting in Crimean Tatar. Now, uh, because the Russian authorities wouldn't give them a new broadcasting license, they ceased to broadcast on March 31st. Uh, this has been a major blow to the Crimean Tatar community, but is also considered a symbol for the way things are going for just different voices, anything that doesn't support the government line in Crimea. But first, just to set the mood, we want to show you a clip from their last broadcast. So hopefully we'll bring that up right now. Мы не такое переживали. Те, кто ехал в телячьих вагонах в далекую ссылку и терял по дороге родных, друзей, тела которых вертухаи просто выбрасывали из вагонов и сгружали на коротких остановках, им было труднее, чем нам сейчас. Те, кто выживал в первые годы депортации, когда голод и болезни выкашивали десятки тысяч людей, им было труднее, чем нам сейчас. Те, кто жил под комендантским режимом, без паспорта, без права покидать резервацию, им было труднее, чем нам сейчас. Тем, кто после смерти тирана не получил права вернуться домой и подымал на ноги своих детей на чужой земле каждый день, плача о потерянной родине, им было труднее, чем нам сейчас. И тем, кто в начале 90-х годов бросив обсиженные места, удобные дома и хорошую работу, ехал в Крым, в котором тогдашняя власть встречала их бульдозерной войной и погромами, им было труднее. Им было труднее, когда приходилось жить в палатках, в землянках, даже в брошенном троллейбусе, когда не принимали на работу, когда к погибающим детям не ехала скорая, а это было. Так погибли двое детей, не дождавшись помощи в одном из пригоров Симферополя, отравившись угарным газом. Неужели мы Помня обо всем этом, сейчас пойдем в депрессию, даже кто-то задумается о том, чтобы покинуть Крым. Тот, кто убивает АТР, Ляле и Мейдан, видимо, именно на это и рассчитывает. Зря. Наш народ пережил Сталина. Неужели не переживет нынешние проблемы? Переживет. И выживет. И будет дальше строить свой дом на своей земле. This hasn't been an easy year for journalists, so here in the studio we have a former ATR journalist Emine Jaiparova who has moved to Kiev, and also a freelance photographer uh, Emine Ziaddinova who is uh, covering also Crimea with her photo work. So the first question would be really what is the significance of the ATR TV channel? Is it an opposition voice or the voice of Crimean Tata? What all, what this uh, mean? My grandmother, uh, she came back from Uzbekistan actually pretty late in 2005, and she always was saying that uh, she had never the chance to watch TV on Crimean Tatar language, and she always wanted to see the, to watch that television. And she was very happy to have it at there in Crimea, and especially and Radio Maidan as well. And um, um, and so I think it's importance of like. We never had the chance uh, during a long, long history to have our own language on TV and have like institution which would uh, pass the culture and language and would like would pass the voice of Crimean Tatars to the general public. And just so. to interject, because uh, you know this was mentioned in the video, but maybe not everyone knows that the Crimean Tatars were deported from Crimea to Central Asia uh, in during, yes, yes, during like the war. In the cattle in the cattle wagons, and it was kind of a tragedy for all mm -hmm. people. And there is also was a kind of a comparison during the marathon, "Don't Kill ATR." 
kind of the, the final half an hour of the ATI existence in broadcasting, the owner of the channel, Ilinur Islamov, he said that if ATI would ever move to, the, to Ukraine, it would be the second deportation for everyone, because kind of the feeling and the sentiment of the channel is that the channel is a voice of Crimean Tatars. So mm -hmm. it's, it not only provides with objective information, but it also um, involves and invites people into the atmosphere of Crimean history and culture. Mm -hmm. This is something we were deprived for many years. Um, well, and that was just when you were mentioning your grandmother, I just wanted to emphasize for people who were deported, who didn't have access to media in their native language, and many of whom have struggled to return, there are still Crimean Tatars who you know, are in Central Asia or in Uzbekistan or elsewhere. That has a major significance. Everyone watches ATR, as far as I know, even my family, they start mourning. Do they watch it because you used to be on it, or uh, why? No, 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 it's, it's something, it's, it doesn't matter, it doesn't, it doesn't have any relation to me walking there. It's just mm -hmm. the Crimean Tatars, they do start their mourning with this you know, morning shows, TV shows, just making coffee, you know, watching this TV show, and again uh, plunging into this atmosphere of Crimean Tatar culture, because this is the only one and the first Crimean Tatar channel, which gives really professional information and gives a kind of professional picture. So how in general the environment changed for the journalists who work in Crimea, how are they are re reacting to this uh, change in regulation and accreditation? Have they stopped working if they haven't been uh, able to get the accreditation formally? Are you asking about ATR channel journalists? In general, because it we has changed drastically. About ATR, can I just trying to um, inform all others who doesn't know. This is the fourth, the fourth time when the chairman uh, and the chairs of the channel submitted the documents for the mm -hmm. federal service for supervision of the media work. Uh, and they didn't have a kind of a official refuse or something. They were always back. So the set, the package of documents always returned back with no kind of argumentation or they said they were, they claimed that there were some mistakes in filling up the documents, but the lawyers checked it up several well, times. Well, this is also an old, um, I mean, Soviet tactic, but also Russian to, to delay until things can't be done anymore. To I mean, scare people, I think. Well, to scare people, but not, not necessarily, you know, to ban something outright, then that's kind of clear what you're doing. But if you, you know, keep delaying and denying and saying reform this and redo that, but it doesn't change. It has the same effect, but it's harder it's still, to it's attribute. It's still unknown whether they're going to provide uh, with this Russian registration or not, because mm -hmm. I talked to the general director of the channel just yesterday, and she says that Monday morning they will start working as usually, so journalists mm -hmm. would come to their you know, working places, but they do not know whether they will receive this registration. I mean, and how is, uh, I, I know that you work a lot also with the foreign journalists and how it's in general for people to get the information there. Well, um, it's it gets really, really hard to work in Crimea right now. Uh, first of all, you have to have all permissions from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia to uh, accreditation to work in Crimea in general. And second of all, uh, there is always, always this feeling that uh, FSB can come anytime and the, check you. The Russian Security yeah. Service. Yeah, the Russian Security Office. I mean, we were stopped on the border when we were entering Crimea. I was getting in with Danish TV crew. And uh, they asked me to go to the room with them, and I was questioned for probably 45 minutes uh, about this Danish TV crew and what our plan, day by day plan, and where we are going to stay and other things. Um, they didn't introduce themselves, so I assume it's either a federal security service border control or some kind of institution. Well, how's that changed? Because when you were with them, you were covering the one-year anniversary of annexation. Yes, uh, has, has it become harder for foreign journalists to work there since then? Uh, yes, it is harder to work. Um, also, like to get access to any official parts, you have to apply for special accreditations through the press secretary. So it's like very bureaucratic process, even mm -hmm. to go to the I don't know to the school where they're holding the I don't know lesson for the anniversary of the uh, annexation of Crimea. But um, also, it's really hard because people don't really, uh, people are afraid to talk to journalists as well. Mm. Um, I mean, uh, 
people are scared because there is um, all these laws about extremism and the law about separatism, which they can charge either fine or five years. It's what is this law on separatism? <laughs> We're just curious. Yeah. It's a Russian law on separatism. It's Russian law. They passed last year in May or June, I think. As there is one law, it's about extremism, another one law about separatism. So um, if you use the words like annexation, Crimea is Ukraine. Occupation. Occupation. It's all go under of two of these laws. And if you use these words in media, uh, it's, it, it can go to the five years in prison. Uh, so I think ATR also stopped using these words after May because they, yeah. uh, they could have been charged with criminal charges. So you have to be very careful with, those, with the words you use. And the, the main thing is, again, I want to stress that it's impossible to work in Crimea as a journalist if you do not have any accreditation, which you can get only with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 main, the second aspect, which is very, which is you know, outstanding, is that the people are scared to talk. It's mm -hmm. impossible, if, especially if you're a TV journalist, you cannot record anyone because they are scared but to show up their faces. what are people scared of? Because we were speaking before the show and you were talking about how the atmosphere in your f family in Crimea changed as well. They are scared of well. rummaging their houses. That's normal because they are scared if they show up at the TV and the security services will, you know, just fix them as a, as a well, as someone a talking, yeah. 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 it will be very difficult for them, for I, their children. Uh, and how it's also for the, the journalists who used to work there before, are they, uh, I mean, you've moved, but you know, the people have stayed also, there were some Ukrainian media, their outlets for 20 or more years, pretty well established. Some of them moved away, but how it's in general? Which I, I had only one kind of accident with the prosecutor's office because I was, I used to enlighten the um, situation on the 3rd of May when Mustafa Jamil was banned to enter. Mm -hmm. I was a Radio Liberty journalist by that and I had an official invitation to the prosecutor's office. But as far as I have registration in Kyiv, I asked them to um, send the documents to Kyiv and they said, oh, we wouldn't do that. So I said, okay, I wouldn't come. And that was stopped. This is my personal uh, example. But of course, journalists, of course, they cannot work without any accreditation, which is mm -hmm. really make the system, you know, just kind of they, they cannot be in touch with everyone and everything which is in Crimea, right? Well, and what, what is happening now? I mean, you've moved to Kiev, you're here now, but the majority of Crimean Tatars have stayed there. And who, who is left, who has stayed? Obviously, this land has a huge significance yeah, for Crimean Tatars. I wouldn't say that. This is some kind of, you know, it's, they sacrificed a lot to come back to Crimea. It's impossible to move, to migrate for, for, the, for the majority of Crimean Tatars. In my, my situation is a little different, different because I got my education here and I mm -hmm. was always affiliated to Kyiv, but it's very, it's unique, I would say. I wouldn't say, you know, that there are waves of, in thousands of Crimean Tatars are fleeing to Ukraine, to Kyiv. It's not true, because mostly Crimean Tatars, they do feel that land their own. Mm -hmm. So I um. think, it's impossible to say I can, that. I can add. Uh, I think the general statistic by UNHCR is around 20,000 uh, in internally displaced people from Crimea. It's not only Crimean yes. Tatars, but also Ukrainians and Russians who moved. But uh, about Crimean Tatars uh, who move, uh, it's uh, people who has um, chance or uh, money to move as well, um, because like to move some have to have uh, like enough like financial situation allowing you to move. There are also um, uh, Crimean Tatars who were part of um, Tahri, uh, Hezbut Tahrir Hezbut Tahrir movement, which is illegal in Russia, so they cannot really stay. They were, they they were, to move, right? yeah, they were the first ones who moved, and it's not about financial situation really. So they moved. So there are different groups. I mean, you know, some education, some financial, but then also people whose political status and activities yeah. it's made it harder for them. Yes. We wanted to illustrate one thing. We have a, an infographic we wanted to pull up just with the demographics of Crimea. Mm -hmm. um, this was from based on the 2001 census, so before Russia annexed Crimea, but to give an impression, you know, Russians are about 60% of the population, and then Tatars are about 10%. So no, it's not. I, uh, oh, no? The official is yeah. about, it's about 13, 14, the official 13, numbers, 14? but the fact numbers, it's about 15, 16, I would say. Mm -hmm. And in that way, what role does ethnicity play in treatment by the authorities after annexation in Crimea? 
Could you specify I mean, the how, question? How different is the attitude to the different, you know, ethnic groups <laughs> remaining there? And how, I mean, we kind of feel that, you know, definitely Crimea Tatars is one of the group, the Ukrainians, but it's also unclear. Uh, what if you are Russian, how you are treated? I do have a feeling that Crimea Tatars, as a most politic politically structured political force in Crimea, is oppressed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, what is the goal behind? Difficult to say, but I think the main goal is to demoralize, you know, just mm -hmm. to make the Crimean Tatars weak so that they could not awaken because they, they, this is the force that is still believes that Ukraine would ever come and help and just, you know, um, kind of save Crimean Tatars. I I would say that the problem is not that uh, Crimean Tatars is ethnically different than Russians or Ukraine, and I would agree with Emine that the problem was that Crimean Tatars is where political opposition and political opposition doesn't exist in Russia. So uh, Crimean Tatars became a target. I don't think there is the same kind of issues for other ethnic groups. Um, only thing like I would say is that probably ethnically Ukrainian who are pro-Ukrainian, who are the same and have the same issues, not even pro, not even ethnically Ukrainians who are pro-Russian. Mm. Well, and one of the issues, I'm going to pull up one of your photos now, hopefully if we have it here, which um, maybe we'll get it up in just a second. But, you know, it, one of the fundamental issues that's been going on since annexation is this question of who does the land belong to. In Russia, and especially Russian propaganda, Crimea is often presented as this Russian homeland. Putin's even called it yeah. a holy land, comparing it, um, you know, to Jerusalem for Jews and, uh, and all of that. Um, and we have one of the pictures, I hope there we go, yep. you know, this, uh, you know, so showing kind of images of the harbor with Putin talking about, you know, the return to the native harbor and all of that. I mean, what, what was going on when you saw this graffiti and what, what's, what's that message all about? Um, I, it's about propaganda and about marking the territory and making uh, visual markers in the land about who this land belonged to. And they're making a statement by this painting that Crimea have been and is and is going to be part of Russia. And, but I want to tell, actually, it was a really funny story uh, near that uh, painting. I was working with TV over there, and we were uh, trying to find people who, what they think about this painting. And um, we asked people on the uh, bus station, and they were a fight because one of the women were pro-Ukraine and she didn't like the painting and she was not agreeing with Putin politics in Crimea and in Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine actually. And there are a bunch of women just start screaming and shouting at her and were saying like, if you disagree with it, just get out from Crimea. Uh, I mean, it's not very funny. It's actually a very sad situation, but I feel like it implies to all Crimea. If you have a voice which is different than majority, like it just, you, you, would, you will get attacked. And what, I mean, what is the, what space is left for Crimean Tatars in that narrative? You know, if this is a, a Russian area that's returned to Russia and that's the real history, where are Crimean Tatars in that? I, I, I have an answer. Crimean Tatars have a space only to talk about freely only in their kitchens now. Mm, their houses. Did you mention that after the occupation, Crimean Tatars kind of, I, I couldn't see them on streets because before, whenever you go out on streets, you see, you know, faces. You do recognize. Um, and other faces. And afterwards, it's some kind of they disappeared at once. I'm not sure about that because, like, actually, right now you would see like all these Crimean Tatar flags on Crimean Tatar cars everywhere, mm -hmm. which was like uh, I was surprised and I was like, wow, everyone has Crimean Tatar flags everywhere. Well, and it seems you know a little bit how you've seen in Kiev and parts of Ukraine. There's been more national symbols, kind of reinvention of you know colors and flags. The Crimean Tatars seem to be using that prominently as well. Yeah. But just because you touched on this issue of faces, um, I wanted to pull up another picture of yours, because a big question, especially for Crimean Tatars, has been these so-called self-defense forces that were organized, um, vigilante groups that are there, that have, you know, have officially been kind of condoned by the Russian government, but seem to function autonomously, have been connected to a lot of abductions of Crimean Tatars. And this picture, I don't know if you had seen it when it came up. Um, what was the story behind that, or when was that? Um, it was uh, March of 2014. It's in Bakhchisarai near military base. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually talked to those uh, um, soldiers. Uh, they were saying that they are from Russia openly, even though in that point uh, 
uh, Russian authorities were denying that they have uh, Russian army present, it's that Russian army is present in Crimea. And there were some local guys, I think, like wearing masks from mm. self-defense, or maybe they were part of soldiers who are not on uniforms, so I'm not sure. Um, so, I mean, that is a story. and. Um, uh, I, there were people, local people, in all this self-defense, but there were also a lot of people in the self-defense who were coming from, I don't know, Krasnodar, from some other parts of Russia. I mean, I, I was having some uh, phone numbers for them because we worked a lot with them during um, last year in March. Mm -hmm. And I tried to call them in June when I went back, and they were all still Ukrainian um, phone, like uh, mobile phones, so it worked. And some of them didn't work at that point at all, so like, was, yeah. I don't know where they were, probably well, but not. On anything. your last trip, I mean, what was, were these self-defense groups still very visible? Were they still uh, active? Yeah. They are still active. They were active in June, and they are still active, actually. Uh, I mean, in June, we were stopped by self-defense and checked documents in the square. And this time, I actually was staying at the apartment next building to the self-defense office. So they were always, they still go at 7 in the morning uh, every day to do this, um, I don't marching, know. Marching, marching yeah. on the central square. In Simferopol every morning, and as far as we know, uh, self-defense troops are it's a kind of a personal, political, and military power of Aksyonov, and he legitimized them, right? So yeah, they separated or were they independent from the police, uh, Russian police and Russian know, military? I don't know. What, what is their connection? I, I, it's really difficult for me to understand when it comes up to these, you know, official things, but they, there was a decree of Aksyonov when he legitimized them in terms of the legislation, but I don't know if they are the part of the internal service. I, um, the, the last question for me would be, you know, what Ukraine what the rest of Ukraine, the government in Kyiv, uh, can do to uh, help the life of Crimean Tatars and the people from Crimea. So far we know a lot about a lot of complaints connected to the bureaucracy. It, it's a difficult issue because I would like to stress some statements, right? St stress some points. First of all, Crimea is still the territory of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. and we do believe that it will have, it, it has to be back. The second is that the Crimean Tatars are the indigenous people of that land and they have the right to restore their rights on their own land. This is the main thing I wanted to deliver. Um, I would say that uh, people who stayed in Crimea, I think there is a general atmosphere and feeling that Ukraine just left them alone to deal with their own problems. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure Ukraine really can do anything in Peninsula right now, but I think it's really important to deal is Crimean internal displaced people and mm -hmm. make it bureaucratic. It's not as bureaucratic and easy to get all these documents and things like to move here, for example, and to make sure that all documents and all these issues with documents like passports, birth certificates, all these things possible to go to Kherson and deal with them as well. I mean, um, I talked to a man and his daughter is going to turn 16 soon. Mm -hmm and he doesn't know how to get her from Crimea to Ukraine to get her passport because she would not have Ukrainian document to pass the border. So she didn't take a Russian, Russian uh, she's, citizenship? She's still 16. 15. She's yeah. still 15. Oh, so they're thinking about how to get passport for her. Okay. And it, it is an issue. I mean, how would she cross the border? But no passport. And what do you say? I often hear that uh, when you speak about the solution of the, the the conflict in Ukraine, especially because of the war in uh, the east of Ukraine, uh, when we talk about the inter in, in the international conferences, that you know, let's leave Crimea so far, you know, like and especially for the Ukraine, let's don't raise this issue. It's gone. <laughs> And especially that's what we hear also from, from some, you know, uh, analysts like European and foreign that, you know, this is too, too far. <laughs> what a silence I think it speaks about. Uh, I do, I do, I also have a feeling that there is a kind of, um, that certain amount of politicians, they do believe that Crimea is a ballast, which just has to be thrown out, you know, just not to make it difficult the political negotiations mm. with Russia and so on. Well, the on. focus has shifts since, you know, you've had this instability in fighting in eastern Ukraine and Donetsk and yeah. Luhansk, then there's been less focus on Crimea. It's, so it's a kind of a card in hands of Putin, 
and he's playing with this, you know, the main card. Um, but I think that but officially Ukraine declares that Crimea is a territory of Ukraine, but it looks like that sometimes it doesn't go further but for declarations, because we do not have even any ministry or we only have a service for the Crimean which is the head of the Mustafa Jamilev, mm -hmm. and there's also kind of a department in the cabinet of ministers, and that's all. No money raised, no, I mean, de facto, no certain steps taken or undertaken to, to get Crimea back. But we do, we do understand that Ukraine is a kind of a more puppet state in this whole game, which is the international game, obviously. Mm. I would say uh, that um, people in Crimea, especially Crimean Tatars, they really hope and uh, honestly hope that probably Crimea will return someday to Ukraine. But I personally um, not sure about it. But I do believe. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very, very much. I mean, it's something that we're going to continue to look at closely. And there's been so much change and development over the past year. And it's really uh, an open question for a lot of people where things will go from here. So in the second segment of our program, we would like also to talk about this um, notion of the frozen conflict, which Crimea can also be described, and uh, about how to solve the, uh, the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. We also asked the British historian, the professor of modern and European history of, from the Oxford University, Timothy Garton Ash, who uh, had been uh, in Kyiv this week, and what he had answered, you'll watch now. When we speak about the uh, solution, uh, there are a lot. Uh, there are debates on arms. On you know, Soros uh, says about the money, but what would be the broader strategy? Because uh, you know, for the for uh, the solution of this Russian-Ukrainian well, conflict. Well, you remember that Alexander Herzen said, "In general, modern man has no solutions." So probably there are no solutions, but there are ways forward. And I now think. Alas, that the best way forward is for Ukraine to consolidate and strengthen its own position as it is, and if that means accepting a frozen conflict for some time to come, why build up your own state, the strength of your own state, including the armed forces of this, of this country and everything else, Maybe that's what you have to do without conceding the legitimacy of what's happened in eastern Ukraine or in Crimea, because that's a very persuasive argument. I think that's the first step. Time, if you do that, is on Ukraine's side, on Europe's side, on freedom's side, and not on Putin's side. But there are those who argue that the um, goal of uh, Russia is often to destabilize Ukraine, and also this kind of frozen conflict could be just a one part of strategy. So how to protect against that? So in order, I believe Putin's plan A, ever since the Orange Revolution, was to keep Ukraine somehow in the Ruski Mir, somehow under his sphere of influence, and Yanukovych was doing that. He lost plan A, so he went to plan B, which is to take Crimea, parts of eastern Ukraine, and then keep the rest of Ukraine as a dysfunctional state, a weak dysfunctional state. And I believe that is now what he wants to do. So. What is needed is to prove that Ukraine can be a functional state. And then Putin has to go to plan C, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're being joined by Alexander Sushko, who's one of Ukraine's top security analysts and who is the director of the Institute for Euro-Atlantic Cooperation. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, just a question for me and maybe to explain to our viewers, first of all, what is a frozen conflict? What defines it? Uh, once you can't solve a conflict, 
the better way is to, to freeze, because otherwise it will be violence, yes? So, but but you, uh, there is no chance to find comprehensive solution. So the better way under these circumstances is to freeze. And there are some uh, examples in the world, uh, frozen conflicts exist, uh, as long as the international community is not capable to solve it uh, finally. And uh, is what is going on in Eastern Ukraine a frozen conflict so far? <laughs> I think that uh, the, 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 obviously there are some different components of the conflict. Generally, this is a conflict between Ukraine and Russia. And there are some regional elements of this conflict. When it comes to Crimea, for example, now this is a classical frozen conflict. So there is, there is no war there, mm -hmm. but there is no solution there. And there is no chances to find solutions soon. So this is a classical uh, frozen conflict. When, focusing when, it, yeah, on, when it comes to Donbass, uh, it's still uh, not fully frozen. So there, uh, uh, if it comes to the uh, attempts to build certain solution, for example, through the ceasefire, that may lead someday to the frozen conflict. Uh, so, I mean, part of the key element of a frozen conflict is that there are unresolved issues. I and mean, when we look at Crimea, which you mentioned and are saying follows the classical model, the issue is that, you know, it, was, it has been a part of Ukraine. Ukraine has not ceded it. Russia has claimed it. But if we have an infographic we could pull up to show some of the other traditional frozen conflicts in the former Soviet Union, you have Transnistria, uh, you know, which was part of Moldova and then attempt to secede, not formally recognized, but functioning separately. You have Abkhazia and South Ossetia in Georgia. Now in Ukraine, we have of, you know, both Crimea and the so-called LNR and DNR. And there are also Nagorny Karabakh. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's what we have on our uh, map. But also, what is interesting and important to mention that the uh, it's way more people than, for instance, in South Ossetia. There are a million of people in Donbas, while there are just 50,000 in South Ossetia, what people often forget. But isn't this is a desirable solution for Ukraine? As it was mentioned by, for instance, Timothy Garton Ash, to have these uh, territories uh, frozen, you know, and then maybe built Ukraine, made it prosperous without that. What is your take on that? <laughs> okay, so uh, desirable solution would be different. But sometime, uh, sometime the, the, the side on the, the, the side in the conflict is uh, restricted by certain circumstances. And uh, it is just unable to solve this conflict. So under these circumstances, the temporary solution would be freezing the conflict. Uh, but nobody knows how long this frozen period will, would continue. So there is no, I would say, way to say that Ukraine is desiring to have a frozen conflict on its territory, but sometimes it looks like there is no other chance. Well, this is the question, is it the best Ukraine can do to freeze the conflict at this point? Mm. And what is the Russian intention then in that way? Do, uh, will okay, Russia prefer okay, that? Okay, if if there is a acceptable condition posed by Russia, for example, if Russia accepts some way of solution, uh, but through giving uh, Donetsk a veto power, for example, in, for domestic politics, for example, one day they accept that Donetsk and Lugansk may be some way reintegrated um, under uh, legitimate power of Ukraine. However, on the condition that uh, these uh, local uh, separatist administrations will have a veto power when it comes to foreign policy decisions, uh, domestic policy decisions. So Ukraine will just not be able to pursue any domestic and foreign policy at all. So that condition would be unacceptable. And that would be better to have a frozen conflict than that kind of solution. So that's an example. Well, I mean, what um, there are people who have speculated that one of the reasons why Russia has supported frozen conflicts in different post-Soviet republics is that it's a strategy to destabilize. Is that a common element? I mean, you're saying if these regions were to have a veto power, that would be a way to destabilize Ukraine because they'd have a veto ability. Now, at the moment, you know, the, what separates Crimea from Donbass is the fact that this conflict, the frozen conflict, heats up. That that also has a destabilizing power. Yes. So uh, at this moment, we may uh, recognize that 
Russia have some different scenarios and different conflicts. There is no one model. And uh, Crimea and Donbass are obviously two different models. So uh, in Donbass, uh, Russia wants to impose a certain mo model of solution mm -hmm. which would uh, transform Ukraine into a dysfunctional state. So the, the, these uh, particular areas will have a power to block any sovereign choice made by Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So that would be a proposal. And uh, certainly, uh, certainly if, if it goes through this way, it uh, would not be accepted. For example, when, if we compare the situation uh, with Moldova, Transnistria conflict. Tiraspol, uh, the center of separatist uh, region of Transnistria, doesn't have any power over Chisinau. So they, they, they exist, nobody can change this in a short-term perspective. However, at the same time, they, uh, the Tiraspol cannot affect uh, mm -hmm. uh, Chisinau government, and that's why it cannot undermine the European choice of Moldova. If, just imagine, today, in the fragile, balanced uh, situation in public opinion in Moldova, Transnistria part would vote, or take part in the uh, national process, so they will have pro-Russian government in Chisinau. And I'm not sure what is better for Moldova as a nation. So this is a kind of the con con in Ukraine it's a different situation because we do not have any uh, any real chance to have pro-Russian power in power in Kiev. But, but when, we, when we look at the Donbas, mm -hmm. when we look at the DNR, the so-called DNR and LNR in those areas, is there another frozen conflict that's similar to that? Is there another model like that? No, uh, now there is a dynamic conflict. So when mm -hmm. when we say frozen conflict, we usually mean some old conflicts mm -hmm. which once were hot and they were frozen, frozen. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they leave certain time in a status of frozen conflict. Mm -hmm. So in these terms, Donbass is different because it is still not frozen. It's still hot. Yeah. If the um, aim of uh, the Kremlin would be to make, you know, Ukrainian state dysfunctional, what would be the indicators that this strategy is working, that is progressing? that uh, there is already a strategy which not fully released yet, but it will be presented as soon as there will be a progress of Minsk agreement. One of the parts of this agreement is about talks on the changes to Ukrainian constitution. And when mm -hmm. the, when the, the Moscow through this uh, Moscow controlled separatist leaders would propose something for the new updated constitution of Ukraine, we will see, definitely. These proposals will not so much about the autonomy of Donbass, mm -hmm. but these proposals would be mostly all the leverage of Donbass controlled by Moscow to the central government. So, uh, so the, 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 the major, the major um, idea uh, by Kremlin here is not to ensure local governance in Donbass, but rather to ensure leverage through this uh, uh, separatist entities to get influence over Kyiv. So who so benefits the, from the Minsk agreement? Hmm? Who benefits from the Minsk agreement so far? No, uh, the, those people who survived are benefiting. Yeah. So, because otherwise we would have thousands of more dead people just. So, so I think that in, the, in general terms, certainly there is a, uh, the, the society uh, benefited. But there is no guarantee that it is sustainable. And there is no well-designed way ahead. And there will be lots on at each stage. We will have a debate on what is the substance of the Minsk Agreement because uh, they, they are written in a way which may be interpreted in different ways. So there is no, no one interpretation of what does it mean, I mean, certain formula in the agreement. So, so the problem of Minsk agreement is that they are too, too ambivalent, and the, the, the sides will use it in order to insist on their own priorities. And uh, that means that the whole process will be continuously under the threat uh, of the renewal of the war, because the sides are unlikely to reach consensus on the most uh, comprehensive elements of the future. On you, in your opinion, what would be this, uh, not the solution, but at least some kind of the first step to reach some consensus with current circumstances, with current agreement, with current forces? Um, I think that uh, uh, there will be, uh, the, there is a framework which is 
the contact group, and this is a, a format which we have seen in Minsk, uh, including uh, Germany, uh, France, and probably there is, a, there is no other way today than to use this format again, even if we understand that it is far from being perfect. And there are lots of criticism on the Minsk format. However, uh, within this format, there is a chance uh, to uh, start uh, certain negotiations. And these negotiations would be kind, kind of guarantees not coming back to the full-fledged war. And at this particular moment, this is, this is important. I am skeptical about the chance to find a final solution, I mean, in a short-term period, on constitution or whatever. But Ukraine needs time. Ukraine needs time for breathtaking, I would say, uh, uh, period. Uh, Ukraine needs well, what time. What is the need time for that? For reforms or to restructure? Or what is the time for needed for? For everything. Ukraine, um, before Minsk agreement, Ukraine was almost exhausted. So it mm -hmm. is, there is no way to continue uh, like it was before, um, I would say, before uh, February. So Ukraine needs this time. It should be used without any illusions that mm -hmm. we will find uh, consensus with aggressors. Not. But we will have a time and there will be a chance for government to strengthen institutions, mm -hmm. to provide reforms, to strengthen military capacity and security capacity, to be better prepared mm -hmm. if the Russians try uh, to, to undermine resume the war, we will uh, be better prepared. But with that insecurity, I mean, moving forward, since it's not quite clear what is happening or what could happen, what do you think the greatest, greatest challenges to Ukrainian security are at the moment? You know, we've had these uh, issues of bombings in different cities. Obviously, there is issues of fighting in the east. I think that the, the, the institutional uh, capacity is still the biggest challenge in all the uh, elements central governance, local governance, military and security governance. So Ukraine is still a weak country. It is not so dramatically weak as it was a year ago, mm -hmm. but it is still weak. It needs, again, time and professional, uh, professional efforts, sustainable efforts to build capacity. And strengthen the structures. Yeah. So what is your uh, take on the uh, Western strategy towards the mm -hmm. uh, solution of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict and how will you describe it? Hmm. There are just few uh, common elements which may, we may identify as Western strategy. In fact, we have different strategies. One of them are more uh, determined to help Ukraine. The others are rather determined to, uh, to a certain extent, to punish Russia for violation of international law. Uh, so uh, we have this policy of sanctions. We have very moderate, modest policy how many to uh, support Ukraine. And, uh, Certainly there is no feeling of, I would say, um, uh, sustainability of this policy. And we are afraid that uh, there will be some forces soon in the West to undermine even existing policy, not even saying about more, I would say, more consistent support for Ukraine. I think that ad under these circumstances, uh, what is more important is to mobilize Western actors to, uh, to provide a more comprehensive assistance package to Ukraine. Because survival of Ukraine and its consistence as a sovereign state would be more crucial even than the punishment of aggressor in the mid-term perspective. So I think that uh, there is an obvious need for the West now to support Ukraine, then, uh, then it will be safe, safer life for the West in the future. Then if Ukraine collapses, there will be more problem and there will be also a threat of collapse of the entire Europe. So I think that uh, this year it will be uh, challenge to for the West for if it things. is capable able to find a consensus on the on the program of support for Ukraine. All right. Well, some very interesting comments on structuring institutions as the greatest way to uh, secure Ukraine's safety. Thank you so much, Alexander. It was Alexander Sushko, the research director of the Euro-Atlantic Institution in Ukraine, a Ukrainian analyst on security. And we going on to Tbilisi, to Georgia. This week, uh, Georgia was in the news again, as Ukraine formally refused to extradite former Georgian President Mikhail Saakashvili. Uh, he faces uh, the charges of corruption at home. And we are calling to Tbilisi to a prominent Georgian journalist and the dean of the Kalku School 
of media. Nino Zhezhelashvili to understand how all this scene in Ukraine, uh, they are back in uh, Georgia and also what is also happening there with the relations to Russia. So um, I understand that Nino should be already on Skype. Yeah. Thanks so much for being with us uh, this time. And Nino, the first, uh, the first question definitely from us is um, how are the charges brought against uh, Mikhail Saakashvili seen in Georgia? And um, yeah. Good evening. It's my pleasure to be a host, uh, guest, uh, guest in your program, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Okay, about Saakashvili. In Georgian audience, uh, it is a, a, a big discussion about uh, his new position in Ukraine and uh, the positions of different uh, uh, the, the team members of uh, Saakashvili, who is now having also quite uh, good positions in the Ukrainian government and uh, decision-making position in, in, in your country. Uh, so, but uh, I'm a journalist, so I will just put facts uh, together. I will avoid um, expressing my personal opinion and everything when I'm mentioning now, uh, and I will mention now the majority and minority, I'm relying the uh, latest election results. Okay, let's say majority Georgian dream having more than 50% in the latest elections and minority 14% is UNM, a former Saakashvili's party, which is now in the minority in the government. So I can say that majority uh, is not um, satisfied. Um, uh, due to the fact that Saakashvili now having a decision-making position in, uh, in the Ukrainian government. He's an advisor. Uh, he is uh, making statements from Ukraine, and it's not nice for them who choose Georgian dream as a as a as a ruling. Party. But Nino, if I can ask, you know, there are two different things. There is one issue, which is how popular his politics are and how popular his party is, and then there's the second issue, which is whether or not most Georgians believe he be you know belongs behind bars, that these charges are legitimate, or are they politically motivated? What what's the impression of that in Georgia now? You know, it's still uh, the same, uh, what I can say. Majority thinks it's my personal perception that it's uh, he needs to answer a lot of questions of prosecutor office and minorities uh, thinking like Saakashvili thinks that it is politically motivated all the uh, allegations against of uh, former president. And you know the latest news that uh, uh, the, the, the Ukrainian rejects, Ukraine rejects Georgia's request for extradition of Saakashvili. And uh, you are uh, informed that Saakashvili is wanted by the Georgian authorities. So logically, the majority of uh, Georgians who supported the, the acting government, they are against of, uh, the leader of, of uh, the former government. So um, um, they, they don't like that uh, their former president now is representing uh, another Another government, especially the government of the friend, friendly, uh, friendly uh, surrounding and the, the one of the closest uh, the neighbor. But, um, mm -hmm. at well, but on that point, I mean, if you know, Georgians are frustrated with their former leaders. Are they disenchanted with the Rose Revolution? Are they moving away from the West towards Russia? Do they feel these kind of priorities aren't the same anymore? Uh, you know, the West is still in the priority, uh, declared at least priority of uh, the Georgian dream, which is the ruling coalition. But uh, uh, if compared with the, the, the old government of Saakashvili, the rhetoric is absolutely different against of Russia, if we can say. Uh, Saakashvili's party, we all, we all know how he was expressing his opinion against of uh, Northern uh, the neighbor, neighbor. Now the, the the new government is having a much much uh, careful uh, you know position and uh, the the rhetoric uh, uh, Russia. Uh, the, let's let's discuss the frameworks where we are talking with Russia as a, as a, as a state. We have uh, now new kind of uh, new kind of frame which is the um, talk between um, the deputy uh, foreign minister of Russia Karasin and uh, a special representative in Russian Georgian relations uh, Mr Abashidze and uh, it is only direct contact with uh, Russia and Georgia because we don't have any diplomatic relations for the moment. This kind of direct 
direct uh, contact between Russia and Georgia was not in agenda of uh, Mr. Saakashvili and his mm -hmm. government, and uh, they were and they are still against as an opposition of this kind of talks mm -hmm. because they think that Georgia always need kind of witness from the international surroundings. But does, do Georgians think this is working? Because even if there aren't formal relations, you know, there's been criticism in Ukraine because after Russia annexed Crimea, after there's been these different events, you know, Georgia did not impose any sanctions on Russia, which is seen as attempting to be more diplomatic to avoid conflict. Nonetheless, there is recently this treaty concluded with South Ossetia that some people have compared to the annexation of Crimea. I mean, do Georgians see warmer relations as helping them? How do they see the relationship of the moment. You know, uh, uh, the, the, the mood of Georgians against of Russia the, did not change at all. According to the latest uh, you know, polls, which is done by the, the International Republican Institute, uh, the, it, the results were issued uh, at the end of March. The supporters of NATO membership, we have 78 percent still in Georgian audience. It is almost the same which we got in 2008 during the referendum on the same issue. So the mood is not changed. But the discussions, uh, the, the, the what kind of relations we need to, with Russia is intensified. And we can find very active new NGOs, new established and new appeared NGOs in the Georgian society uh, who are widely discussing the issue. Um, the, the maybe, maybe not NATO. Maybe Russia would be better. Maybe this Eurasian uh, the, the Union. Why not? Uh, so these kind of questions, we are not on the agenda at all. Any debates uh, during Saakashvili's government. Uh, Nino, uh, so the question would be: So what is the role of the Russian money in this uh, Georgian politics? When you mention especially those NGOs, because when you talk a lot, many people uh, remember how like this hybrid, hybrid war. Fair when you know the different NGOs are used to uh, impose Russian politics, pro-Russian politics in different post-Soviet countries. Um, is there any feeling of any danger? How independent are this NGO and how genuine is this movement? Of course, we can say that they can't be genuine. They are financed from Russia, and not only NGOs. Also, in media surrounding the Russian money already appeared. You can see it from the screen, from some quite a small new established channels. Direct Russian propaganda is flowed. So um, we can say that Russia is quite active towards Georgia, but not uh, like uh, it acts uh, in Ukraine last uh, last month or in Georgia the, in 2008. No, they are now trying to um, brainwash people here and uh, the, to, to get a kind of uh, more sympathy of Georgian citizens. And you know what is the main I mean, uh, the message of um, uh, pro-Russians, so-called pro-Russians, who are the same number, I would like to underline once more, but now they became active, so they are more seenable in the scene than it was some months even ago. Uh, their rhetoric is like this. Uh, I'll, I'll quote now one of the MP who is, uh, quite the, 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 by the way, the, uh, one of the leaders of the governing uh, the coalition. He is saying that and not NATO did not accept us and they will not let us, let us in NATO. NATO is not accepting us. It's aggressive military bloc. So they're, you know, circulating this message that NATO is not accepting us. Russia is here. Russia is our neighbor. Russia is holding the positions in the breakaway regions. Why not to talk with them? Maybe if we say no to NATO, then we gain more interest from Russia. What we would like to understand, uh, that is often unclear. So these are the separate, totally separate movement, or, they are, or uh, Russia is also um, trying to do all its, uh, in, kind of spread its influence over the current Georgian government? Uh, you know, the, the, I just mentioned one of the persons from the ruling coalition. Uh, he is the leader of uh, so-called Industrial Party, which is the Georgian Dream Part, the ruling coalition part. And uh, when the leader is stating uh, anti-Western, uh, you know, uh, statements, and uh, when uh, he is still staying in the ruling coalition, then we can have questions. 
So if, if the uh, Prime Minister is saying that, no, we are pro-Westerns, and if uh, his uh, coalition member is saying that, okay, NATO is not good for us, so this, this thing is, something is not correct, something is uh, doubtable, and so the opposition is quite, um, quite um, uh, seriously criticizing the government because of uh, this position. They, are, they think, not just Saakashvili's party, but new kind of opposition, which is the former uh, ex, uh, the, the, the ex, ex defense minister's party, Free Democrats, uh, the Mr. Mm -hmm. Alassania's party. He is also saying that uh, the Georgian government not so much pro Western as it was before. Well, but, and the, uh, a question yeah. with that. I mean, there is an article with uh, in Foreign Policy that we can pull up now to show that was talking. I mean, not only about Rush, increased Russian influence in Georgia and the use of soft power, but to a certain extent that the West had taken Georgia for granted with that. I mean, is this, is it the case, because often Russia will assert this, or people critical of pro-Western leanings in post-Soviet countries will say, this is the position that Russia's neighbors have to take, that they you know, can't be confrontational with Russia like Saakashvili was. Is that the consensus now in Georgia? I mean, do you think that is where Ukraine will have to be, that eventually they too will have to take a softer note when it comes to Russia and its directives? You know, Ukraine was an example for Georgia. The 2008 war is also the quite a close history for us, newest history. So, uh, the most of Georgians think that uh, the Saakashvili got uh, against of Russia was not uh, diplomatic, at least. Uh, so we need to change something, but uh, it's my personal opinion that uh, the new government uh, did not find yet what kind of policy they need to follow. And uh, they are trying some different angles, but uh, they are not quite strong enough. Uh, they don't have uh, a real enough. solution. They just don't want to continue. It's there. All right. A different question just from, you know, your experience having worked as a journalist for a long time and being very well respected in Georgia. What happens, you know, after a revolution, after many people who work in journalism and civil society and NGOs move into government, can journalists keep their objectivity? Can they be objective? Can they be professional? Uh, what effect does that have on society? And how can journalists continue to work that way when they know many of the people people who are in government? Uh, you know, the Georgian media was uh, suffered during the last uh, nine years when Saakashvili was in power because he united uh, especially Georgian televisions under his, uh, you know, the influence and uh, we were getting the same messages from the government and every channel, which was national wide channel, was following the, the same agenda. Now the situation is quite uh, better. Uh, those who moved to the politics, they did not, They are not back to the, 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 the media. Now we have different position. Media is uh, diversified, but uh, they are still um, uh, under control media outlets in Georgia. We have no uh, the objective, uh, real objective media and real neutral media towards the political, you know, the wings. So, uh, the, yes, uh, the, the journalism is not... Uh, not uh, perfect in Georgia, I can say, it, but uh, there are some uh, kind of uh, islands of truth uh, that Georgian people and uh, the audience knows where to find them. And when something is happening, they are going and addressing them to get the news from these media outlets. Nino, thanks so much for being with us. We wish all the best for the Georgian journalist and that it won't be just Thank the islands. Uh, so um, that was Nino Zhelfili from Georgia with us. And we uh, go into a different topic, which is always a topic so far. Um, even, on uh, even officially, there are more than 1,300, 1,300,000 uh, internally displaced uh, persons in Ukraine. And Hromadske uh, has launched a Special, launched a special pro project, Displace, uh, where it researched um, different conditions and all the obstacles the IDPs uh, have and how they are trying to adapt to their life. And in the first episode, uh, one of the f stories we would like to show and concentrate on the uh, how it, uh, how the crisis uh, has, what, what impact it has to their psychology, especially to the psychology of children. So this is a report about a 10 years old Slava, the boy who uh, had 
lived in the village close to the Donetsk airport. Their family has to move to Kharkiv, to the city on the east of Ukraine, and there the, his family is very concerned about uh, that he's still remembering the fighting. It's not just the one story, but you can watch yourself. So now we'll be moving into a slightly different direction. We're joined by guests from the Visual Cultural Research Center who recently received a prestigious European Cultural Award for their entry comparing the 2013-2014 Maidan protests with other social movements around the world. We have a brief video just to give you an idea of some of their work and then we'll be back to speak to them. Открити університет Майдану мав свою власну сцену зі своїм власним дискурсом, великою мірою альтернативним до того офіціозу, який можна було почути з центральної сцени. І нашою ідеєю як інституції була у тому, щоб дати людям певну порівняльну перспективу, щоб вони могли зіставити себе з іншими випадками протестів, які відбулися у світі протягом останніх років. Якщо зважати на політичні процеси, які відбуваються ось у 21 столітті, політичні стратегії все більше запозичують із поля мистецтва, із поля візуальності. І з іншого боку, самі комунікують переважно візуальними засобами. Те мистецтво і те культурне виробництво, яке вважає себе поза політикою, насправді є найбільш несвідомо політично вживаним. Якщо ми подивимося на те, яким чином було розпалено війну в Україні, багато в чому це було зроблено за допомогою інструментів культури. Можна подивитись на те, яким чином історія, і історичні питання стали інструментом розпалювання ну, просто відвертого громадянського протистояння і війни. Саме тому потрібно на цьому полі працювати, щоб реалізовувати в ньому можливість іншої політики. Громадське телебачення. So we do have here uh, Vasil Cherepanin, who is the head of the Visual Culture Research Center, and Alexey Radinsky, who is also a member of this center, uh, both involved in many different activities. But in this video also, you've mentioned that, you know, how the art and how the visual culture have been used to create the conflict in Ukraine, and do you think it can fix it? Oh, probably, uh, hopefully. Um, it's rather, I think it can be useful rather for, for the external use, I would say, on the international arena. Because uh, art and in general the cultural field can really shape or fashion the representation of Ukraine, which is really very much lacking today on the international arena. Was well, Ukraine a blank canvas, a tabula rasa um, for most people? Yeah. Yeah, to some extent, because I think the, the biggest problem here is that Ukraine has been always like absent on the mental map of the West. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, discursively, Ukraine is really very weak, 
Because if you take, for example, the initiatives that are launched by the Ukrainian state, they are um, not very efficient in presenting what is a real Ukraine on the international arena. And what is the real Ukraine? Is it just uh, embroidered shirts and painted eggs? Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you for the joke. But, uh, no, it's not a joke. That's part of the culture. I mean, we're coming yeah, but, up to uh, Easter. But yeah, what is I mean Ukraine? That, uh, today, the Ukrainian society is much more successful in, in presenting real Ukraine mm -hmm. or other faces of Ukraine to the um, external audience in the state, because if you take, for well, example... they've gone around it, right? That's mm, what we've seen. Yeah, 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 because uh, all those initiatives that the state has launched, mm -hmm. like, for example, uh, like the Ministry of Culture is treating the culture itself mm -hmm. as being the service for the army or for the war, mm -hmm. uh, or, for example, the Ministry of Information that has created a kind of a clone of the Russia today, Ukraine today. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty, like, uh, pretty funny and uh, discursively very weak because culture and that is the role of culture and art that it can shape Ukraine mm -hmm. on the international arena and can create its own front of struggle. But when you say it's weak is it because it's not original because it's copying or what makes it weak? Yeah, maybe it's uh, very much old-fashioned, not using the up-to-date discourse. Maybe it's the problem of the vocabulary, the problem of the absence of the proper political language. Because mm -hmm. Ukrainians, uh, which, which was obvious actually on Maidan, they are much more sticking to use uh, some substitutes of language, like poetry, singing, praying, and so on. Mm -hmm. But what is really lacking today is a coherent Ukrainian narrative which can be... What is this? What is this a coherent Ukrainian narrative? I don't think it actually exists, but I would like to actually add something to Vasil, what Vasil said. I really believe that culture should be instrumental in fixing the conflict internally in Ukraine, not only on the international level, because it was actually very much instrumental in creating this conflict. Yeah. Well, which the is, as we know, and yeah, assertions yeah, of which, that. as we know, are artificial, but the way you make the artificial conflict real is by the means of culture. For example, mm -hmm. uh, you can look at the ways the language and the linguistic issues were instrumentalized to make this artificial conflict into a real war. Uh, for example, uh, the, of course I mean the artificial manipulation uh, with the so-called discrimination of, Lush, of Russian language or Ukrainian language and so on. Uh, so I think that it's even more important that, than using culture on the international level to, to go back internally and fix uh, things here. So, and uh, you, you were speaking so um, uh, so long about this Ukrainian narrative. So what is something new and innovative about the Maidan? Because that was something you got this award as well, that, you know, this comparing different social movements. So what was new while they recognized it? Um, well, I think... Uh, Can Maidan be, be something that it's added something new? Yeah, of course. Maidan... Uh, Begun like a uh, totally new narrative because uh, actually when we when we take when uh, Ukraine first appeared uh, in the Western optics it was uh, actually because of the revolution somehow it uh, it was the 9th of uh, March 2001 uh, the first police clash with the uh, clashes with the police on the Bankova Street at the present administration in the frame of the Ukraine without Kuchma movement then the second time it was the Orange Revolution. I mean, when Ukraine was like a headline, a real headline. And the third time is, is Maidan, actually. But so is, is the Ukrainian narrative only when people abroad pay attention? Because people abroad pay attention when there is protest, when there is violence. But is that the only time the Ukrainian narrative matters? Yeah, yeah, that is a problem, that uh, we don't have other instruments, other discursive instruments, other uh, narratives to be told. So Ukraine is a totally an untold story. It has to be narrated, because that is a problem of representation. It is a basic uh, political problem, because mm -hmm. all, the, all the political um, uh, structures we have are based on representation. And Ukraine is totally unrepresented, or misrepresented, rather. It's a very unfair story for Ukraine, because it's filled in with a total lie, especially, of course, influenced by the Kremlin. And about the post after the Maidan, what are you focusing on? and what are the most controversial issues for the artists to cover now? Because that's what you are sometimes researching, to being somehow in a different way than the general public opinion. 
I think, unfortunately, this kind of um, central issue of uh, Ukrainian art nowadays is war. I would say the art is kind of doomed for a very long time to deal with this with this issue. I don't Why think do that responsible. Do yeah, I don't think that any responsible artist or cultural practitioner can avoid this issue mm -hmm. and kind of stay in this uh, kind of self-isolation. Kind of um, kind of shelter. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but but this also may be also a blessing because uh, the, in this way, uh, kind of art and culture actually may become the tools of uh, of solving this problem and in a way of contributing to to solving this conflict. But what are not like a taboos, but the the art is the good art often deals with something very painful then when it's really painful, then it may be work and heal. So what are the issues now for the Ukrainians, for the artists, for the society? Yeah, I think both the artistic field as well as the political one are sharing somehow the same challenges and the same problems. So what problems. are they? Um, well, first of all, it's, it's about honesty. It's about truth. Uh, both fields, I think, uh, shouldn't imitate something but uh, they should honestly speak with people. They should uh, have to, need to conduct uh, the politics of truth. It's, it's very crucial, especially today, when we are living after the re revolution and the time of war, because the, authority, the Ukrainian authorities, unfortunately, are lying to the people. But and what's going wrong? Because you had this new ministry, you know, named the Ministry of Information yeah. that was nicknamed the Ministry of Truth. Now, there's critique of that, but yeah. I mean, the essential goal, the baseline goal, yeah. which is to take control of the narrative, that Ukrainians can tell this narrative themselves, that yeah. they don't need Russia or the West. Yeah. Why, why isn't that working? Yeah, because uh, maybe because Ukraine is still not a separate subject. It is not subjectified. Mm -hmm. I mean, because usually when you take the outside optics, Russia is the real subject. It takes care of the whole space of the post-Soviet uh, of the post-Soviet space. Usually, Ukraine is just the subjectified. So and isn't given agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah the agency and uh, for inside and for outside. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you see, uh, what what Ukrainian strategy is now is like cloning or copying the Russian examples. Which is, which is totally wrong, because you cannot properly answer uh, to propaganda with counter-propaganda. The, the only instrument you have is truth, because the lie is an instrument, is a characteristic of the weak. And uh, truth is the only thing we have to, to oppose really to the Russian aggression. But my question with that, you know, we had a whole program focusing on propaganda. And unfortunately, it's often the case that people watching media don't know how to recognize truth. That unless truth is packaged well, presented well, yeah. quickly, attractively, it's not enough. So I, I'm hesitant to say that truth unto itself is the antidote to, to propaganda. Why do you think it is? Well, uh, truth is just uh, the starting point. Um, it's just the basic uh, like stone on which uh, some strategy, political uh, vocabulary, uh, narrative, uh, cultural, artistic can be built on. So, it, but it, it's, a, it's a crucial point because without that we are just missing the horizon. Because we cannot answer, we are dealing with uh, which is called hybrid war. And the, the main thing, the main feature of the hybrid war is that it is the, the war itself is denied by the aggressor. But it's not only about hybrid war. We are dealing with the hybrid Russian state, with the hybrid Kremlin. Maybe the biggest problem is that Putin is a, hy a hybrid. But we cannot answer like cloning the same hybrids here. We, are, we, we don't have to create this kind of creatures. We have our own ones. And that, that is the problem to, to make them visible, to, to put them, to push them on the political surface. But they are, not, they are absent there. Still, unfortunately. In uh, your acceptance speech uh, there, uh, while you were receiving the award, you were also um, speaking about the role of Ukraine to Europe and also what uh, is often missed here, at least you often uh, raise the issue about the difference between the EU and Europe for the Ukrainians and it's often missed by the Ukrainian society and also by the Europeans. What do you mean by that? You asking me or maybe yes, like see. Both anyway. Maybe you. Um, I think there is a huge difference, of course, between the not only between Europe and EU, but between different kind different kinds of EU. Uh, we know that uh, inside the EU there is not a single vision. There is no such thing as. EU values or European values. This is especially feasible 
uh, if you go somewhere to Brussels or somewhere to Athens, there is no such thing as shared European values. This is the lie that we are being told, unfortunately. There is a, a clash of values inside the EU, and I think that uh, the Maidan movement actually kind of contributed to this clash of values from the outside. And of course, uh, the values... Between yeah. which values there is a clash? Like there are kind of many names to these values. Uh, to put it uh, very simply, there's a clash between the, ide the neoliberal uh, ideology of austerity and the ideology or idea of solidarity that, uh, that the European Union was kind of based on. It's been hijacked and been replaced with the ideology that uh, translates into austerity and into the kind of devastation that actually happened in Greece, in other Southern European countries. This is not a uh, European value at all. This is a particular value that was imposed on the whole project. And uh, I still believe that uh, this whole project can be reclaimed and uh, uh, this so-called European values like austerity, they can be pushed to a dustbin, and so it should be. So, you, so you, when you were receiving uh, it, uh, you got the, the award along with the Athens, uh, Athens Biennale. So, in the some way that was the Ukraine and uh, Greece, which are kind of the problematic points yeah. of the Europe. Uh, do they think we th we are facing the similar issues, just with opposite uh, kind of narratives? Well, of course not. Uh, we were like presenting to different contexts somehow, and uh, yeah, that's why I think the, the award itself was uh, really a very powerful political event. It was a good opportunity to uh, to present not only the institution, but to represent some context in, uh, and represent not in a usual way as so-called professional politicians are usually doing. Uh, so that's why I think that one of the main messages that we are, were trying to deliver to, to the audience in, in Brussels was that uh, the EU today is, uh, is challenged. And it is challenged by, uh, uh, by two phenomena which, which are pretty traditional and historic for the, for the Europe in general. First of all, it, it, is, it is challenged by revolution from the Ukrainian side, and now, of course, it is challenged by war, which is coming closer and closer to the, to the EU border. And uh, Europe now is like at the crossroads. It's overshadowed by war, but it's also challenged by the Ukrainian revolution. And it has to decide, because uh, there is a clear, clear choice for, for the EU. Maidan or anti-Maidan. And uh, these two, two faces uh, are really like staring at, at Europe. And, well, but still, it seems that, that Europe has no answer to this, to this situation. Well, and that's something we'll continue to watch. But thank you so much for joining us. Uh, that's the end of our show for tonight. But we want to invite you back next week when we'll have a special program focusing on IDPs in Ukraine and their situation. Good night. <laughs>